freestanding uh, 40 feet of uh, 55 G. It's a little bit exceeded, but he figures, well, he's not going to work the 20 meter band anyway. He's just going to confine himself to the 15 to 10 meter bands, and so he works out a beam antenna that'll be only nine square feet of antenna. <clears throat> this brings it down to 17,200 foot pounds, which is just essentially equal to the allowable uh, figures for the 55G tower. So he decides to go back to that. That's probably a good solution to his problem. To do that now, he must design himself a foundation block for the concrete that will hold that, that 55G tower, 40 feet high with a nine square foot antenna. So here's the way he works on his design. He decides he will take a four foot deep hole there and he will make the thing uh, block Pour concrete block three feet square. The volume of his concrete will be three times three times four, 36 square feet, 150 pounds per cubic, I mean, uh, uh, cubic feet. 150 pounds per cubic foot gives us the block weight of 5,400 pounds. Now, to upset that block, just assuming it was sitting out on the driveway, not buried in the ground at all. To calculate the moment that it would take to turn that block over, you multiply the weight of the block times the half of the length of the side. That is, if you turn it over, it would rotate about this toe point here. And so the weight would be considered center here. It's a distributed load again. So you multiply the 5400 pounds of concrete times 1.5, 8,100 pounds of restraint moment for that if it was just sitting out flat on the ground, not buried at all. From the lateral bearing strength of the soil, just as we did for the anchor column, anchor post, we calculate again. Three times, see it's three feet across there, so it's three square feet of area per foot down, times three and a half the distance from the bottom up to midway on the first foot down, 400 pounds per square foot of lateral bearing strength. So we got 4,200 foot pounds for that first foot down. We get 6,000 <coughs> foot pounds a moment for the second foot down, 5,400 30 foot down, 2400 down here. So due to the lateral bearing of the soil, we have a restraint of 18,000 foot pounds. <coughs> the tower weight is bearing down on this also. And that, again, the weight of the tower gives us some additional moment against upset. That tower uh, will weigh 420 pounds and times uh, 1.5, because it's bearing down the center of the block, 630 foot pounds, <coughs> giving us a total moment of restraint of that block of 26,730 foot pounds. We have calculated that there will be 17,200 foot pounds at the moment, and the uh, moment of restraint of the block will be 26,730. So we have a safety factor of 1.55 of that poor concrete foundation. So that is a satisfactory <coughs> answer for the book. So his guess was right in uh, selecting that concrete block. If it came out wrong, he would all over again with a different set. <coughs> well, let's leave that fellow for a while and consider the situation where we have more than one guy level on a guy tower. Let's uh, go to the situation with the guy as he had on that uh, 50 foot uh, tower, 50 foot or long 25G, guided at the uh, 40 foot level, 
and again you got it at the 20 foot level. Now this gives you a problem, a type of problem, which in mechanics is called a static indeterminacy. You will see that same kind of a situation on the hinges of a door. There's a door over here and it's got a hinge up here and a hinge down here, let's say. I ask you how much of the door's weight is going to be on one of the hinges and on the other hinge. Well, who can say? It depends on the exact spacing of those the hinge places on the frame of the door. It, it's not a calculable thing, and it is a statically indeterminate <coughs> system. The only way you can approach it is if you knew the elasticity properties of the door and of the door frame and the exact spacing. We don't try to calculate things like that. But on these guide cables, where you do have uh, uh, a, a static indeterminacy situation, you still can make a decision on how you're going to handle it, how you do it. And so here's a good way to do that. <coughs> we'll say <coughs> that the uh, that we'll call this point up here, this guy A, this one B. The unguided base moment again would be this 24,062 foot pounds that we calculated before. If you look there, it doesn't count with no guys. The moment from the top guy would be 40 feet pounds. This guy's uh, horizontal thrust would be 40 feet on the left one. That on the lower guy would be. 20 feet times its tension. And we say that those must resolve this uh, unguided base moment of 24,062. Furthermore, we will go ahead and say that A is twice B. Just we'll make a we'll just make an assumption that we're going to tension those guys such that it will be that way. That the tension up here is twice the tension on this one. That is not the guy tension, but the lateral training thrust of the guy. <coughs> Working this out algebraically, then this tells us that if we say A to B, that this says 80 B plus 20 B is going to be the 20,062. Which says 100 B is 24,062, or B the horizontal thrust of the lower guy will be um, 240.62 pounds there. A will be twice that, 481.24. So the total horizontal restraining forces here will be 721.86 pounds. Now you say, hey, what happens now? Because when we had only one guy, up there at the 40 foot level, it was only 601 and a half pounds. And now you tell me it's going to be 721.86. Why are the difference? The difference is that by putting the lower set of guys on there, you relieve some of the horizontal thrust on the foundation. Before we put this one here, wind blowing in here was putting the forces on here, and likewise, a certain amount of that force is trying to blow the thing off of the foundation, which it can't do anyway, because it's a concrete block or something, and they didn't want to break that. <clears throat> but this way, some of the force that would otherwise go on to the foundation is uh, being resolved by the lower set of guys. And it has the advantage of reducing the bending moment in the lower part of the tower. So it is uh, uh, protective in that respect. But, uh, there are times when it's very favorable to have that. I just wanted to show you that there is a way of uh, determining that. What was the assumption of A? It was too big. What was that for? If you do not do that and make these equal, then there is not enough horizontal force up here, and it is going to increase the moment on the tower lower down in it, and it may 
exceed the uh, allowable bending moment of the tower. It's just better to do that where it is twice as high up the tower to assume that you're going to tension those guys in such a way that you will have a large restraining force up here at the upper guy level. That answer the question? Any yes. other questions about that before we go ahead? <coughs> Now you say, well, how in the heck am I supposed to determine the tension on the guy cable? Well, that's, uh, that's not a real easy thing to measure unless you have some special instrument. Well, there is an easy way to do it. And the way you do it is you take hold of the guy and you start it swinging. Now, you swing it side to side, not up and down like I have to it this way. You count the number of complete swings, call it N, in feet seconds. Maybe you time it with a stopwatch for 10 seconds and count how many times that guy will swing back and forth as a normal resonance of the guy. Then, if you take W, the weight of the guy in pounds, and that includes its insulators and any other hardware that's on it, times the length of the guy in feet, times N squared, that is the number of swings, in so many seconds, divided by 8.05 p squared. And that will be in pounds. That will give you the guy tension in pounds. You're calculating like it was a fiddle string in the normal oscillation. And so that's an interesting little way that you can do it. On very long guys, such as uh, we use on, on very tall towers, like the uh, 500 foot or 1,000 foot towers, instead of trying to swing the guy that way, you hit it with a piece of two before, a wave will travel up it and down again, and you count how many times that course comes back to you in uh, so many seconds. And use the same formula, and it gives the same results. It gives you the tension <coughs> of the guy. So it's not a, not a bad little formula to remember, because you can apply on this. Our amateur towers, which generally are not over 100 feet high, uh, it's a little easier to make the measurements by getting the guy in the swinging oscillation that way. It has an ultimate strength of 3,990 pounds. 
mainly led to what attention is the 399 pounds initially, with no windfall. They sold the sag out of it, essentially. Uh, if you're using quarter inch, if it's a higher power, and you use a quarter inch, that is uh, about 6,600 pounds uh, initial uh, uh, ultimate strength. You tension that to uh, 660 pounds uh, to fall within EIA specification. Personally, I do not like to uh, draw up the guys quite that, that taut on an amateur tower. I, I prefer to leave just a little bit of sag in it so that I don't have continuous uh, thrust against the anchor post in, in mild light winds, why it leaves the anchor post substantially unloaded and it's not as likely to <coughs> pull it through the soil. Um, if you make it uh, too loose, the, the thing will tend to gallop in, uh, in high winds and it flop up and down. You don't like it to do that. If you make it too taut, it will go into what's called aeolian uh, vibration. That is, it starts singing like a fiddle string. And you know, that's not a very good thing either because it may uh, work hard on some of the structural parts. You know, so you have to use your own judgment on that. You're not bound by any uh, adherence to the uh, EIA uh, standards on, on such a thing. But uh, just my preference not to be thinking not to uh, make initial tension as much as 10% uh, of breaking strength. Uh, I'm starting to say that uh, uh, some amateurs, many amateurs, including myself, uh, like to use uh, the tower itself as a vertical antenna. Let me show you uh, a few pictures of some antenna installations that uh, are that way. Whit? Yes. Uh, Ann says you need to speak up when you're next to the screen. <clears throat> okay. Whit is your wife of 51 years, ma'am. You to stay close to the microphone. Your voice is getting lost back here. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> All right, I don't get up here to the microphone. I'll yield to higher authority back there <laughs> from W5 and HI. Uh, here is a picture of a uh, tower which is used as an antenna. Let me see if I can get this in the Some of you people that may have visited there uh, recognize this as the base of the 120-foot tower at uh, KC5DX down at Scurry. And this is a, a distant view of it. You can see the tower going all up, way up halfway to the moon. And down here at the base, you'll see it sitting on an insulator. Let's take a closer look at that. <clears throat> Here's a close-up of the base of the of Hazen KC5DX's uh, tower. Now let me um, show you what's in there. <clears throat> the base of the tower rests on a large insulator, this type of insulator we call a station post insulator. You pick them up from the power company's junkyard. <laughs> They're used for uh, uh, support in transformer stations, support of bus work, the switch gear, sometimes small transformers. And uh, they're very strong, and uh, uh, quite large ones are available. That's a pretty good size one. Rated to stand a vertical thrust of 15,000 pounds, which is uh, substantially more than the uh, weight of a 120-foot tower plus the tension of the guy, the downward thrust of the guys. Now, this big coil here is um, used as an isolation coil at this station. He has, um, uh, he has a 20-meter beam on top of this uh, tower. And of course, there's a problem of getting the rotor cable and the coax up on the tower around the base insulator. And this is the way it's done. He has a big coil, large diameter copper tubing. With the rotor cable and coax, you see, coming up out of the ground, 
going inside this round and round and round.